key founder and leader of the Spanish Falange. Jose Antonio Primo de Rivera was born in Madrid to an upper-class family, where he was mostly under the care of his aunt, since his mother had died when he was only five years old. Primo de Rivera entered the University of Madrid, where he studied law. Being an outspoken voice at his university, he quickly developed a reputation for being charismatic and well-read, as well as for getting into fistfights. He registered as a lawyer in 1925, and made a good reputation for himself as a capable attorney. By 1928, he was reading from a diverse collection of sources, including Spanish traditionalists, Marx, Lenin, and Spangler. Initially not interested in politics, Rivera became more and more influenced by his father, who was dictator of Spain from 1923 to 1930. His father, while initially popular and successful, eventually lost his support to the king and the military, and had to subsequently flee to Paris, where he died from fever and diabetes. The younger Primo de Rivera looked up to his dad, and it appears the main reason he entered politics was so that he could defend his father's legacy against the liberals of the Second Republic. After years of decline and Spain's humiliating defeat in the Spanish-American War, drastic change was called for in Spain, which led to a mix of anarchists, socialists, traditionalists, and fascist parties rising in Spain. After the previous success of his father's dictatorship, Primo de Rivera and the rest of Spain were demanding a return to authoritarian governance, one that could bring about a national restoration and an illiberal economic order. Using his hefty salary as a lawyer, the young man started writing about political theory and founded the Falange, taking great inspiration from the Italian Mussolini, who was also a friend of his father. The Falange at first relied on monarchist sources for funding, and in return served as their shock troops against leftists. Primo de Rivera also got in contact with Ledesma of the Johns, who was a more revolutionary fascist that often had a socialist bent. Over time, Rivera would absorb much of Ledesma's thought, and this, among other things, would lead to the monarchists and other rightists pulling funding from the Falange. While discouraged, Primo de Rivera and the Falange kept organizing and recruiting in Spain while violence and brawls escalated. He saw political violence only as a means of last resort. However, after the Falange suffered numerous casualties from socialist groups, and as internal discontent grew, the Falange quickly organized their own militias for retribution against the socialists. These militias soon had a hand in putting down a leftist insurrection alongside the Republican government in early October 1934. This insurrection was caused by the Christian right-wing CETA party winning major seats in the 1933 election, instilling fear among socialists who saw the left rapidly losing support across Europe. Radicalism began to increase in Spain, and the government had its hands full censoring the left and the right. With leftists keeping the government occupied, the Falange contacted key officers in the military to overthrow the government. Primo de Rivera, however, distrusted the military after it abandoned his dad, and therefore urged a more moderate approach. In 1936, elections were held again for the Republic. While the right-wing CETA party remained the largest single party in Parliament, leftist forces dominated the 36th election. The government soon released political prisoners and the socialist Manuel Azana Diaz was elevated to the position of Prime Minister. Initially, Primo de Rivera praised the new Prime Minister, with one of the Falange associates writing that Rivera has expressed to us his blind faith in Azana. He thinks he will manage to carry out a work of national revolution. The Falange leader also wrote an article called Here is Azana, in which he said Azana would be able to enact important reforms if he built a broad national base. The mood would quickly change, however, as workers of the Falange Syndicate Collins were attacked, with two casualties. A day later, the Falange suffered another casualty, while a member was attending a meeting in Palencia. And four days later, two young law students and a Carlos were shot to death in Madrid by socialist youth. The Falange later killed a police escort of a prominent socialist, provoking a harsh crackdown. 
On the 13th of March, key leaders of the Flans were arrested, provoking a national outcry. The Second Republic increasingly cracked down on the Flans, whereas some socialist militias were given deputy police status. As churches were burned and the Flange was increasingly driven underground, many members of the Spanish right and the general public showed sympathy for the Flange's cause, visiting their leaders in prison, donating money to the party, and becoming Flange members themselves. The government, dependent on the revolutionaries' votes in Parliament, focused their crackdown almost entirely on the Flanges. Between legal trials, in which he represented himself in court, Primo de Rivera spent time meeting with rightist leaders and allied contacts in jail. As recruitment and funds soared, the Flange was organized on the basis of a communist-type cell structure. The Flange quickly changed their tactics to clandestine resistance against an increasingly hostile government. At this time, the very same government was reassigning rightist seats to the left in Parliament, and called for a second election in Cuenca and Granada, two conservative provinces while simultaneously banning the candidacy of Primo de Rivera. A sweeping victory for the left-wing Popular Front was recorded amid armed coercion and blatant electoral fraud, where the preventative arrest of dissidents was ordered by the Republic. As Stanley G. Payne, a historian and expert on Spanish fascism writes, when Azana was replaced as Prime Minister in mid-May by his personal crony, the consumptive and highly emotional Cazares Quiroga, the latter officially declared that the government was belligerent against fascism. Had he specified the flange alone, that might have been justifiable. But Cazares well knew that the rhetoric of his Popular Front allies extended the term to anything right of center. He thus announced a policy of hopeless sectarianism, in which civil rights would increasingly become a dead letter. The breaking point for the Second Republic came on a late July night. A police squad being led by a socialist civil guard captain, Fernando Condes, only recently reinstated after having been convicted during the revolutionary insurrection of 1934, got orders to arrest Calvo Sotelo, previously Minister of Finance of the Dictatorship of Spain and one of the leading speakers of anti-Republican forces in Parliament. Still in civilian clothes, he led a detachment of assault guards and socialist activists, who increasingly were drafted into regular police activities in violation of the Constitution. They arrested Cabo Sotelo, and as the rightist deputy was being driven away in an assault guard truck, he was shot in the back of the head, Soviet style, and killed by one of the socialist militiamen. This was a crime without precedent in the history of European parliamentary government, but by this time Spain had ceased to be a constitutional state. This brought about a national uproar, and previous rightists and military leaders who were cautious of any counter-revolutionary action soon became convinced it was more dangerous to do nothing than to fight. One of these would be the Spanish general, Francisco Franco. On the afternoon of July 17, 1936, military units staged a revolt, starting in Morocco and soon engulfing the rest of Spain.